Hello, everyone, and welcome back. We now have Augustin Mataun joining us. He is actually calling in from Uruguay. Augustin, please join us. Hey, hello, and welcome, everyone. Um, today, I'll be talking about Link and how we use AI for the conservation of the African lion. So my name, as uh, they already mentioned, um, is Augustin Mautone. I work at Trialabs as a machine learning engineer. And I've worked in all sorts of projects, ranging from post detection to lion identification, which I'll be speaking about today. So a little bit about Trialabs. So Trialabs is a machine learning consultancy company, which partners with companies to bring business value and help them throughout all the phases of machine learning development. So from the very inception in R&D to um, putting those systems into production. So let me tell you a bit about the agenda of today. So first, I'll get into who is Link and what's their mission. And then I'll go into the work uh, we did with them. So this will be uh, first a pre-processing doing it with object detection of the faces of the lions. And then we'll go into a two-phase identification. So first using faces as information and then whiskers as information. So, OK, let me introduce you to Link. So why does Link exist? Well, African lions are endangered species, as you might guess. Um, so over the last 20 years, they've lost over 42% uh, of their habitat due to the increase in human population and their activities. So this has a consequence on how the populations get increasingly fragmented. So and lions have to roam over vast areas that no one research group can effectively study them throughout their entire range. So their movements are poorly understood throughout Africa. So there is a need to understand which areas are inhabited by lions in order to understand their behavior and foster conservation efforts. So um, how do you think uh, lions are tracked at the moment? Well, as you can see, lions lack a recognizable code pattern. So it's hard to identify them, identify them by naked eye. So they use these GPS colors that you can see here, which are uh, like, it, they have a lot of difficulties. GPS trans transmitters are super expensive and their batteries run out every, every one to three years. So uh, that, that's super inefficient. And the most harmful part is that lions have to be sedated to, to put that lion to that collar into their neck. So that's very harmful for them. So we're trying to avoid that. So this is where LINK fins, fits in. LINK stands for Lion Identification Network of Collaborators. Link uses a custom web application consisting of a collaborative database combined with innovative AI search and identification capabilities, allowing the consolidation and retrieval of lion data for conservationists, researchers, and government wildlife management. So using image-based identification, they, they are able to identify lions on a non-intrusive way. But how do you think they identify them using uh, images? because I, I just said that it, it was not an, an easy task at least. So they use the whisker spot patterns. So here you can see that they use this chart, which contains two rows. First, there is the reference row, which corresponds to the most complete row of whiskers at the top. And then we have the identification row, which contains an uh, incomplete row with, in this case, only four spots. Then they fill out this chart, which uh, looks at the related position of the identification spots in relation to the reference row. And that gets a unique identifier for every lion. But as you might guess, this process is super slow. And they don't want uh, to do this process over 400 lions that are included in their database at the moment. So over the years, they've been gathering data and manually labeling with the conservationists. So they generated three different data sets. The first one is a data set of images of lions in the wild with bounding boxes around their body and body parts um, so that they can, we can do the object detection part. And then they also got uh, the identification data, which contains images of the faces and the whisker areas of the lion tagged with the ID of every lion. And what they're looking to is foster this information to build a model that's able to automate this process and make it faster for conservationists to identify the lions. So this is where we partnered with them and gave it a, this plan of, of action. So first, we will get the data and try to understand any potential flaws and negative biases that the data may have 
This part is very serious for us because it's where we determine whether the project is viable or not, and whether we need to keep working on the data before starting the um, modeling phase. After that, we will go into a three-phase pro pro uh, project. So the first phase will uh, involve using object detection of the faces and body parts of the lions just to pre-process the images. And then we will go into a two-phase uh, identification uh, for a part. So the first one would be identificate the lions using the, their faces because we decided to begin with this part because images were a lot, uh, had a lot better resolution, like the images were higher quality than the whisker images. Um, and also the, the images contain a lot more features. So at the face of the lion, you can you have the noses, their eyes, their ears. So there's a lot of information that the network would exploit there. While on the whiskers, we only got the whisker spots. But still, we wanted to give it a chance to the whisker uh, identification methods because it's what they used in, uh, to identify the lions manually. And we thought that it might contain some potential. So okay, let's get into the project. L beginning with the object detection phase, this is what the data look like. So for example, we have the two uh, example data sets here. At the right here, we can see the images that contain the whisker area with a single bounding box for each, for each whisker spot. So there's one uh, bounding box surrounding each of the whisker spots. And then on the left, we have the alliance in the wild. This data set is quite interesting because it's got labels around each of their body parts, but also it contains orientation information. So for example, if you look at this uh, label, it says CV, which means head, and then F means frontal, so that the lion is looking to the front. And for example, in this case, if you look, it says C CV, but DR. DR means diagonal right, so that the, li the lion is looking diagonally to the right. This happens the same uh, uh, to all the labels on this data set, and it's quite interesting because it's not very common on object detection problems. But still, if you look at carefully at this data, we can see that the data contains some issues. For example, here we can see a lion that it's lying on the floor, but it does not contain a label of surrounding its head, a bounding box surrounding its head. So this is very bad for training models because it's conflicting information. Here we're saying that this is a head of lion, but here we're saying that this is background. So we don't want that. Uh, so we had to go through very uh, it, a lot of iterations with the client to get to a point where um, the data was consistent and coherent throughout all the data set. And after that, uh, we came up to a data, we received a data set that was definitely improved and coherent. So we decided to move on to the modeling phase. So, okay, for the modeling part, we decided to uh, go with faster RCNN, which is the network we have uh, most experience with uh, for object detection. And we were confident on its ability to work, uh, to work with this data. And I encourage you all to visit trialabs.com slash blog. We have a, a blog there that explains how the model works and how it's trained so that we got some awesome results. Initial results were looking great. Uh, here you can see an example of, of it working, but upon further inspection, we got we faced some issues. Here you can see an example. If you look carefully, image, the labels look fine, but look, uh, upon careful inspection, you can see that, for example, this lion contains a, a double uh, bounding box around its head, and the same happens for this one. So we had to take a careful look at our code and find where the issue was happening. And we, find, uh, we found two major flaws at our code. So the first one was that, as I mentioned, um, the labels contain orientation information. And when we did data augmentation for this data set, we were using horizontal flips of the images. And when we flip these images, the information of the label changes. So on in usual object detection, for example, if you're trying to detect an apple and you flip it horizontally, it's still an apple. So you don't have to alter the labels. But in this case, when you flip the labels, the right, the right becomes the left, and the left becomes the right. If otherwise, you're giving conflicting information to the network. So we had to build our custom uh, data augmentation function for this case, just to take into consideration all these uh, intricacies that the labels contain. But not only that was happening, um, what we also faced was that there is something called an uh, NMS filter, which prevents the labels from the same class to being over, uh, predicted over in like overlapped. 
So in this case, we have two labels, for example, uh, for heads. But they are not getting removed from with the NMS filter because one says head right and the other head says head front. So we had to build our own um, custom NMS filter too to, uh, to uh, take into consideration that those labels belong to the same class but are just different states for the same label. So after fixing uh, those uh, two bugs, we finally got some really good results. Um, so this was great, but still we wanted to know whether the model was not overfitted to the to the data. Because what happens is, since we only have 400 lions at the data set, we wanted to make sure that the model hadn't learned to only uh, predict those lions. We wanted to make sure that it was able to generalize well. So we came up with this ultimate test. So this year was the year that uh, the Lion King came up at the cinemas. So we decided to try it on CGI lions on some of the scenes of the movie and this poster. And the model was working great. And there was no way that the model was overfitted to these lions since they don't even exist. They are computer generated. So after seeing these results, we were confident that the model was um, production ready. Obviously, as most machine learning models, it's very hard to get uh, all the cases correct. Here is a known mission, for example, when lions get too close from each other, um, the lion predicted a single head. This is very common on uh, a lot of machine learning algorithms since it's hard to generalize well to all these cases. But still, we thought that the overall performance was really good and we decided to move to the whisker part detection. Uh, thankfully, applying the same techniques we did for the body part detection, um, we got some decent results. The only issue here is that since images don't have a good resolution, like they are very uh, pixelated, sometimes it's hard to get to know whether the model did a correct prediction or not. But still, we thought that the results look uh, uh, very coherent. So we decided that it was good enough to move on to the next phase. So we got started with ident the identification of faces. OK, so as I mentioned, we began the identification phase working with the face data because we thought it was a bit more feature rich and higher quality. But still, we thought that it was going to be hard to get always the correct lion. So at top one, like always uh, point exactly which lion is um, shown at the image. But we were confident that if we get 10 to 20 lions to the conservationists, we were going to be in, uh, able to include the correct lion in, in that set. So what we, uh, our objective here was to try to point the uh, conservationists to at least five to 10 lions, which they can go later and identify them manually. Uh, which still amounts to great time savings since they don't have to go over the 400 lions that they have on their database. And the other thing we wanted to make sure was trying to prevent to having uh, to retrain the model every time a new lion gets added to the database. So for example, um, in this case, if we add a new lion to a classifier, we would have to add a new class to that classifier, which would need to be retrained to predict that lion. So we didn't want that, so we decided to use another approach, which I'll be going over over the following slides. Um, so the data uh, looked a bit like this. So uh, we have crops of the faces of the lion in their habitats. So the data set contained over uh, 350 lions and over uh, 6,000 images. As I mentioned uh, a few seconds ago, actually there's over 400 um, lions on the data set. But the amount of images per lion varied a lot. So some lions contain over 100 images, while some lions only contain less than, uh, less than five. So um, we decided to remove all lions that contain less than 10 images, since we thought that they were, going, they were going to be mostly noise to the network. So we didn't want that to uh, harm our training. So, OK, for the image preprocessing, we got inspired by a lot of similar problems that have been solved in, in the research community. So there's a lot of research in how to identify monkeys, for example, how to identify dogs, how to identify um, whales. Uh, there's a cattle competition that uses images to try to identify whales based on the um, their images of their tails when they come up of the, out of the water. Um, 
So one of the parts that got the, that got the most inspired was this uh, pre-processing. For example, first we began aligning the images based on something that's very common on human face identification, which is trying to align the eyes of the individual exactly on the same location for every image. So in this case, we would use the object detector to try to detect the eyes of the uh, of the lion and always set them to the exact two same coordinates. That makes that uh, that uh, helps the network have a, an easier time identifying which um, features of the face are the the best to try to identify an individual. So this was very helpful and it improved the performance a lot. And then also while talking to conservationists. We found that the lion's faces changes a lot um, over their, uh, as they grow older. So for example, um, in this case, uh, the lions as a calf don't have a mane, but when they grow older, their mane grows and the, the hair above, around their heads uh, grow a lot, for example, around their mouth and around their ears. Um, so uh, what, what we decided to do was use this prop that you can see at the image at the right, which was what the conservationists suggested to be the most invariant part of the face of the lions throughout the, the, their ages. So yeah, th this helped the model to be a lot more robust to age variation too. So then we decided to go to, to the modeling phase. Um, Okay, for the model, we decided to go with a ResNet uh, 50, which we trained as a classifier at the beginning. So we would get a single class for each of the lions. And once it's trained, we would remove the top layers. Uh, so we would expose a 512 embedding, which we were going to use to try to generate, uh, generate abstractions of those images that we're receiving of lion faces that we then can then compare to try to guess whether it's which lion is the one being pictured at the image. So what, how this works and the, is that if we get three embeddings, for example, and two embeddings are super close and one is super far, um, we know that the embeddings that are super close have higher probability of being from the same lion than the one that's super far from, uh, from these two. So using this uh, technique, we can then go and retrieve the uh, K closest neighbors, K nearest neighbors. So that's what uh, the objective uh, I was talking about at the beginning. Um, so the way it would work uh, as I, uh, is at the beginning, we will go and build a database with all these embeddings. So we will go over all the data set, pass them through the network and store those embeddings into a database. And then when we want to get a prediction, we would just uh, generate, get the face of the lion using an object detector, pass it through the network to generate its embedding and query the database to retrieve the k nearest neighbors. This was working super, uh, super good. And it, it, this, this way of working uh, allows us to uh, add new lions without retraining because adding a new lion would just mean adding the lion's embedding to the database, which is great. But Suspiciously, suspiciously, we got 95% accuracy very fast at top five, um, like with not that much work. So we had to take a better look at the data to find out why the accuracy was so so high without um, taking that much uh, like training or a, a, a data montation or something. And we found this issue. So here you can see images of two lions. And for example, in this case, you can see that this image is not the same from this one, but it's very close. And for example, this image is not the same from this one, but it's very close. So you might be wondering, okay, so what's the issue there? So the issue is that when we split the data into train and test, we will get some of those images into the test set and some of those images into the training set. So when the model is, tra is trying to get evaluated uh, with, on the test set, the images look almost exactly the same as the training set, so we will, um, so it would have a very easy time while um, like predicting those images. So it, it was not a fair comparison, and it was not going to be how it worked on production. So we decided to ask for 20 more lions, which we hadn't trained on, and also uh, that those lions contain very different images from each other. And that way we could evaluate how the model was going to perform on production. When we did that, uh, we got some decent results. 
Here you can see an example. Um, these are the query images. This column contains the query images that we sent to the database, and their rows contains the uh, results that the database returns, so the three nearest neighbors for, for each of those images. And the results good, were uh, really good. We only lost uh, 10 points of percentage, so we got 85% uh, at top five, which we were very fond of because uh, if we return instead of top five, we return top 10 or top 20, which still amount to a lot of time savings, um, we would get, get over 95 or uh, even uh, higher accuracy. So this was, this was really good for us. We were very happy with it. But then we decided to move on to the whisker part since we were only we only had two weeks left, and this was uh, for the conservationists was super helpful already. So as I mentioned, we only had two weeks to work on this project, but um, we decided to do a quick POC to get to understand whether um, the problem was worth worth investing and like uh, spending some more time after the project. So. When we uh, got started with the problem, we faced uh, two different approaches. So the first one would be using image-based uh, pattern matching, and then just trying to match point clouds, which we would extract from the images by using the object detector to try to get the centers of, of each of the whisker spots. And that would generate this point cloud, which we can then try to match to other, uh, other point clouds. So as we saw on some uh, similar research, we, uh, there, the point cloud method is very common. For example, it's applied on whale chart whales, which um, contain like a code pattern, which uh, uh, has a lot of points, and they use astronomical pattern matching to try to match those points. So uh, we decided to go with uh, this method, which is a point set registration method known as coherent point drift which is a deformable method which applies uh, Gaussian mixture models to generate a match between the two sets of points. And here you can see an example where it's working great. But this was not always the case. So for example, here, we can see a case where it fails because the error from the detector got added to this, the error of, of this method, and it fails. Because in this example, as you can see, uh, the blue sets of dots contains only three rows of whiskers while the red set of dots contains uh, four sets of uh, four rows of whiskers sorry so uh, we we had we still think that this method contains a lot of potential but we did not have enough time to go into it a lot uh, because the, our time was running out but we got in contact with the academy and we started sponsoring two students which are currently working on this problem both using these point cloud methods and images uh, using um, image registration to try to match the, the whisker spots. Um, so as I, uh, as I was mentioning, there's a lot of work that's, that's coming about in this area. So the whisker pattern matching thesis of this student is ongoing. It, it's going to be finished by end of year and the results are looking super promising. So we hope to get some results by end of year. Um, then also the, the, there's a cleanup of the data that's happening, which we are uh, happy uh, that the client is investing time on. And then there, uh, we think that we can move on to the mixture of both uh, methods, which is the definite, definitely best way to approach this problem. Um, so, okay, I encourage you all to get involved with, with Link. They have a great cause and the Lions are yeah, are in danger of extinction, so all the work we can make there is, is great. They open source all of this code. I think the object detector and the identificator are not uh, available yet, but they will be in the future. So I encourage you all to visit their GitHub. And yeah, it's been a pleasure. Let's connect. Here's my email. Uh, feel free to reach out. And if you have any questions, uh, send them over. I'll be on, on the chat too. I think we only have a few minutes left, but maybe if you have any questions, go ahead. And thank you. Augustine, amazing presentation. We are getting tons of kudos. Everyone's thinking this is super cool. I don't see any questions coming through, but I see a lot of applause for you. Incredible research. What what tasks you have done and accomplished. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> yeah, good, it's a very, very rewarding project. When you know that you're working for this good, such such a good cause, it's super rewarding. It's, it's very inspiring, right? It makes the day go so fast. Yeah. Fantastic. Well, we've reached the end of our session time and we have our next speaker standing by. So let's thank you so much, Augustine. And we love this presentation. And again, 
you can put it in, you know, the backstage chat or the stage chat here, and he'll keep monitoring through the day. Okay. Thank you, Great. Justin. Bye. Bye-bye.